Hi everyone, it's Suzanne Tucker with Generation Mindful. Thank you for being here, whether you're we're attending live or catching it on the replay. I'm so grateful that you are not only part of Generation Mindful and supporting the launch of the Time and Toolkit, but that you are going a step further and taking this online class and bringing positive, restorative tools to first to your heart and then into your home and then into your world, into your classroom or your work, wherever you bring these tools. So I'm really grateful for you. So to start our session today, we are, just to be aware, our recording went a little south. So I'm re-recording this opening and then I'm going to connect it with um, the end of the live session and then a little recap I did for you. So always know when we do these live things, there is the potential for technology throws those curveballs. And it did that today for us. But I wanted to make sure that you got to, to have a moment to center, which is really what I like to do before I go into any sort of group Q&A or even the classes, as you've noticed. So what we're gonna start with is an exercise to help us ground, help us connect, and to take time to go in. Isn't that wonderful that we got that word time in, right? Because that's really what we're doing. We're moving inward and we're teaching our children that with life, with chaos, with struggle, with curveballs, that instead of reacting, we can respond. And that our superpower comes from self-awareness and from that little ability in life to pause. It can be a quick nanosecond. And where do we learn to pause and to respond? Well, we, we need to practice it. We need to practice it when things are not up in our face. And so that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna start with a little exercise to ground. And this is something you can share with your children. So it starts with just rubbing your hands together and feeling that heat. It's great when you share tools with kids that are physical because it, it helps them get in their body through the body. It's a lot like yoga. So rubbing the hands, feeling the heat, using your senses to move inward. All right, now I want you to be aware of your breath, breathing in through your nose, out through your nose. And now if you feel heat that you've built up in your hands, as you continue to breathe, just let your hands rest on your face. Allow the edge of the palm to rest on the bony ridge under your eyes and the fingertips up on the hairline. And continue to breathe in through your nose, out through your nose. When we put our cup our hands over our eyes this way, we are sending a signal to our central nervous system. And the signal it's receiving helps it know that it is safe to calm itself down. Let your hands rest on your lap. Let your eyes continue to stay closed if you feel comfortable with that. And breathe in through your nose, out through your nose. So warming up those hands, cupping them over the eyes is a tool to calm the nervous system because we know if our nervous system is on edge, it's going to be very difficult to move into the middle and the upper facets of our brain. And we're going to stay in the lower reactive. Okay, so just continue to breathe. Moving inward, feeling what it feels like in you this moment. What's the weather like in there? Just notice, don't judge it. It's not right, it's not wrong. And now before we open our eyes, I want you to think of something that you feel grateful for today. Something about your parent journey that you feel grateful for. Breathe into that and open your eyes. And I love to lead with gratitude because it is full of so many amazing neurotransmitters, dopamine, all the things that bring 
our sense of joy and our brain wanting to open up and learn, when we're feeling gratitude, it's likely that we're feeling open and ready to learn. So it's a great place to start. You can do that with your kids. You can have a practice of reflection and gratitude, be a ritual around your dinner table, maybe around your breakfast table at the start of the day. What are you thankful for? Or if you have a hard thing you need to talk about before you move into it, maybe you start with a gratitude. Okay, so thank you so much for opening that way. I'm going to segue back into class. And um, again, if you have any questions at the end of this entire seminar, please feel free to email me. If anyone is here live and wanted to add in an extra question, um, feel free. I know um, I stepped out for a minute. I don't think I missed anything about the calm down corner. Are you able to just- Thank you, yes. Yeah. So Julie wrote in a great question about the calm down corner. Let me read it. Um, she was asking if, okay, so, um, she's been thinking about incorporating it. So your toolkits are coming out, um, in about four weeks. We're going to ideally be getting those shipped out and they'll definitely be to you by December 8th at the latest. So she's getting ready and she's like, if you were going to use a calm down corner, how would it look? Um, where would it be in your home? And can kids use the space to play in or should it be considered more of a sacred space? Thank you for that question. So, so for use in the home, what would it look like? So for me, it is intention. So I like to create my space before I even create my space. I want to talk about my space with my child and involve them in it very first before it becomes a physical manifestation of taking time to go inward and, and self-discovery and playfully engaging with our feelings, I want to set the stage so that this is a safe and empowered thing that we do together. So that would be my first thing. You guys can start talking about the time and toolkit now. You can be like, ooh, four more weeks, and look, here it is on the calendar, and this is when our box comes. And when your box comes, it can be like Christmas, like it's here, and open it together. And then decide, talk about where do we want to keep this space? Talk about what the space is. The space feels safe, and it feels powerful, and it feels like a place you can connect. If you say that with your child, maybe they'll say, my favorite place is that window seat over there. And you maybe you never would have thought about the window seat. Maybe you were thinking about a corner in the playroom. But they say, I really like that window seat. And then you can think about practically, is that going to work for me or not? So there's going to be a team effect with choosing your space. And then it has to be practical, right? Because you have some posters you want to hang. Um, if you decide that they want to have it in a space that doesn't feel practical for the posters to hang, you can still make it your space, but you can use your small feeling poster and laminate it, the 12 by 18, and you can pull that out if you want. If you, so there really are no limits on where your space can be. Now, what does it look like? Cozy, what feels safe to you and your child? Um, pillows, a blanket, some children like a bean bag. Some like a tent that they literally go in. Some do not like a tent. So there is no one way that it's going to look. And there is going to be a manual that's going to hold your hand on creating your calming corner space. But I'm kind of talking you through a little bit about that manual right now. Um, then I would have a basket of books and I would have some basic tools that I'm going to have listed out for you. Drawing and art for most kids are extremely centering and healing and engaging and fun. So, um, and then if you just want to think about any kind of sensory play that really resonates with your child, Play-Doh, Bubbles, Pinwheel, um, those are going to be fun to have in a basket. That's what it would look like. And then you asked a great question. Is it a sacred space? It's a playful space. It's an accessible space. It's their space. So yeah, you feel a difference. I think if we make it off limits and it's sacred and it's only when there's breakdown, well, I don't want to go in there. It starts to feel like a time out. 
space. This is a time in space. So really embrace it. Such a good question because we might want to be like, no, don't play with the bubbles, but that's so good. Play with the bubbles, right? Because that's, that's where your child starts to learn their superpowers. And you know, you can help draw the lines. You say, you're really enjoying playing with that, um, those bubbles. Let's make sure the next time that we're feeling out of sorts, let's go get the bubbles. And what's gonna happen is your child's gonna start noticing their yellow light brain and self-prescribing regulation. And that's what makes that space so cool. It's not just that everything's melting down and we're in the red light brain, and then we have to go there. They're gonna be playing in that space when they're in their green light brain, so that like a muscle, they can get these tools down and use them when they're not in that space. The last point I wanna make, the reason we have a calming space and a time in ritual is so we can take it out of the space and out of the ritual into life. And so a calming corner is sort of an analogy or sort of a metaphor, I guess. I mean, it's real and it's physical, but it's something that we're internalizing. And what's so cool about it is with children, they learn from things that are concrete. So when we create a calming corner, we're kind of getting structured order around um, all these ideas around emotions and regulation and they in their brain have a place they can think and go and make sense of these things that they don't know yet. They're just learning about, but it's physical for them. It's real, it's tangible. But remember as the adult in the space that all of these things you're doing and learning and sharing and, and you're personally internalizing and growing into, they're not only embodied in that corner, are they? They're, you're bringing them out and into life. So um, yes, thank you. That was a great, great question. Um, does anybody else have a question in the space? Okay. Well, I'm actually going to keep recording. Anyone here that's live, um, I just want to thank you so much for being here. I'm going to say a few more words for our group that are at home um, that are on the replay. Okay. Be just in case we had some tech technical difficulties with that first round. So I will say goodbye to you all now, unless anybody has anything else to share. Okay. And how do I get out of this meeting? You just click the end meeting. Um, thank you. Bye, Julie. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Yes. Anyone who would like to stay in, I'm just going to, I'm going to be going over some of the points we made. All right. Thank you. So for everyone here on the replay, thank you for being here. We had a little glitch with our recording of the first part of this. So um, I'm gonna be going into some of the questions that came in for you and um, sharing a little bit about some of the things that, that uh, we just talked about, the group that's here. All right, so, um, all right. Jennifer shared that her three-year-old, um, she wrote in, my three-year-old is always challenging me. I am, I'm on my third one, so she's a mom of three. I have troubles breathing and staying calm. For example, he threw a glass of water on me and his sister yesterday. I yelled that he could go to his room or clean up the water, neither of which happened. Shortly after, I found him throwing toilet water all over the bathroom. I dragged him out and put him in his room for a minute. I don't normally do timeouts. He wasn't upset about this, but still quite pleased with himself, I think. Anybody know that experience? Yes, right? Um, they're, they're, they're acting out and they're having fun about it. Um, then he actually had fun cleaning it up, making my way through. So she's basically hasn't gotten into the class on boundaries yet. Um, and she's wondering what to do. She's wanting some help with that. So um, some of the points I would drive home um, are that number one, it's really hard to respond when we're reacting, right? So the first awareness that Jennifer had is that she's uh, feeling off and she's feeling reactive by having that water thrown at her or her child. She's wanting to react. And that's where the yelling and the punishment and the going to the room comes from. And for anyone out there finding themselves doing that, I do not want you to feel guilty. I want you to, to feel aware. Okay, 
And as you start getting um, more comfortable with the tools that we're sharing, you're going to make different choices. So with Jennifer, what I would invite is the mantra, connect before I correct. If she could find that pause button to take a deep breath in, and then in her best court reporter voice, say what happened. When you learn to say what happened, you buy yourself a little more time. So if Jennifer said, you were playing with the water and you threw a big cup of water on me, I don't like that. I don't like being wet. And what if you got down low and you paused a minute and your child got to see the results of what he did, the results of his actions? If he's having trouble um, really seeing the results of his actions, you can ask questions. So do you think your sister likes that? He looks over, sister is crying. No. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> if your child feels threatened, so if we are scary, if we are yelling, if we are punishing, the child has, is just going to go into the red light brain. That's what they're gonna do, okay? But that's the power of connect before you correct. If you can truly send the signal to your child that you're on their team and you wanna help them learn from this moment and you're gonna make it a teaching moment, you can help them get those defenses down where they can actually hear you. And that's where they're gonna internalize what you're saying. Instead of it being in extrinsic, these are gonna internalize and become intrinsic motivators, okay? So um, basically what we're talking about is redirecting instead of punishing um, and being team and problem solving it together helping your child have the self-awareness of what happened. And then consequences are great for learning. What's not great for learning is punishment. So be careful. A lot of us are saying we're using consequences and we're really throwing out punishment, right? So how do we know if it's a consequence? One, you wanna be calm when it's delivered. Um, even the best of consequences when yelled and having a lot of energy, around it um, becomes a punishment because I'm angry with you and I'm screaming at you and I want to overpower you and make you bad and wrong. If you can go to these five R's, it will help you. Um, Amy McCready shared these and I love them. Um, revealed. Are they revealed ahead of time? Okay. Make sure that you're talking through the things that you do in your house. So you might say something like, in our house, we play with water in the tub, okay? Instead of, hey, what are you doing? That's crazy, don't do that. You can restate what is. In our house, we play water in the tub. Reasonable, respectful, related, and revealed, okay? If you can do those five R's, uh, I mean reviewed, you wanna review them again and again with your child. So when you reveal them, when they are reasonable, they're not like, you're grounded for a month, um, when they're respectful. So an example of disrespect would be a child who's not getting dressed, threatening to drag them up to school in their underwear so they would be embarrassed. That, that might feel like a consequence to you, but it's disrespectful, okay? And that's like teaching through shame and embarrassment. So um, related and then reviewed. Okay, so um, consequences teach. You know, you can talk, think about if you forget your umbrella uh, and it's raining, you get rained on, you're gonna learn. If you do that enough times, you're gonna be motivated to remember your umbrella. Same thing with your lunch. If you forget your lunch and you have to eat peanut butter crackers every day for four days, that fifth day you're gonna say, that turkey sandwich is looking really good. I'm gonna remember my lunch. And that doesn't happen if your lunch is getting driven up to you. If you don't experience the weight of the consequence, you have trouble learning from it. Okay? So with the water situation, um, cleaning the water up, like you said, he's having fun about cleaning it up. I'm okay with that. He's cleaning it up and hopefully he's learning. When I make it a punishment and you're bad, his defenses are up. He's not learning from that. Even if he's cleaning it up, he's probably not internalizing the lesson. All right, so Krista shared, oh, I wanted to go back to Natalie. So Natalie was the share that I um, sent you on the email. 
Nellie wrote in, and when she wrote this to me, it was about 1130 at night. Um, she just had my heart um, because I felt her heart in her share. So I immediately got on online and, and re re responded to her email. She wrote, I'm struggling and wondering if we could talk this through. I'm through class three, so I'm aware of my triggers and understand what brain my kids are in. Being aware to try to do three correct connectors before asking something. But my two-year-old, he's been hitting, biting, pulling hair, and I try to say how he feels in that moment, but I also don't want him to think it's okay to hurt me or anyone. He goes into a full-on rage tantrum, and I have no idea what to do. I try comforting him and holding him, but he hurts me. What am I missing? I feel like I'm always so tired and worn out, and then I'm pretty much yellow brain most of my day. So that's part of it, I'm sure. I work full time and I'm only, uh, I'm with them in the evenings, feeling like a failure here. Thanks for the feedback. So when I read that, I was just so moved and I really felt her, her own sense of judgment and not enoughness of herself. So the first thing I wrote back is you're doing a great job and your awareness is up and you're noticing. Celebrate those things. So how many of us in this class are noticing things and we're using them to beat ourselves up? Okay. So awareness is always the answer, but not awareness, awareness that's turned inward and directing shame and judgment at ourselves. That will not lift us up. So, um, so I, I said, I, it sounds to me like the feeling it evokes so, so I actually wrote, okay, yes, it sucks to be hit, right? First, notice how this leaves you feeling. So remember that parenting is an internal experience. It's not, there's no book out there. We're not doing it right or wrong. We're having an experience. We're in relationship. So in that moment, she's even just said, I, I'm in my yellow brain. So let's pause that and let's be with that. Let's understand what's going on for ourselves. And I asked her to sort of pause and say, what is the feeling that it evokes in me when my child hits me? And what I picked up was the feeling is, I'm doing this wrong, I am a failure. So I asked her to breathe into those words and if they rung true for her to cancel them because they are false. And when she wrote back, she said, when I read that, I cried. When I read those words, I cried. And that's how you know from your body that that's on the mark for you. That is a resonance energy, right? That is how you are feeling. So now that she's just had that experience of, of tuning in and recognizing, understand, labeling, expressing her feelings, she can regulate and she can parent the way she wants to parent in that moment because now she's free to respond instead of simply react. So I reminded her that yes, her child is dysregulated and that does not mean they're bad. It doesn't mean she's failed them or she's broken or they're broken. Um, that the child is gonna move into that dysregulated um, chaos, fight, flight, or freeze brainstem and no amount of punishment or yelling or, or anything can teach that part of the brain because it's not wired to learn. It's wired to react and to self-preserve. So I invited her to, to do the things we talked about, to get low and to be firm. And the part that I think is missing here are the boundaries. Because sometimes children are testing and that is very comforting to a little person to know that we are there. We are there to be the guide, to be on their team and to set limits. So when you are back in your body and calm, you're able to respond and that could be a firm all done. It could also be, I know you don't wanna hit me. I know you don't want to hurt me. I won't let you. But when we're showing that we're wounded and they're hurting us, they think they have all this power and they, they don't want that amount, amount of power. It's, it's very overwhelming for them. 
But when we're at the helm and we reassure them that we've got this, and we can start to explain to them what's happening, you're out of control, your body, you feel so mad, you wanna hit. Instead of saying, what is wrong with you? We're using words that says, you know what? That happens and this is why. And we're remembering that our child is two, right? They do not have the self-control or self-awareness yet. So do not fear these things because in fearing them, we give them more power and we start to teach our child things that may or may not be true, right? We might start to fill in the blank, you are so blank. And they start to pick up a mirror and say, well, that is who I am. So remember that these breakdowns are awesome. They're teaching moments. So when we limit with that insight and that empathy and we repair the breakdown, we help the child make, a, a, you know, uh, I guess be with the consequences. So like with the water, clean it up, right? Or with the hurting someone, seeing, ow, no, stop, that hurts. Not, maybe not the word no, but um, all done is one, one that I love. Okay, a limit, if this is done, ouch, that hurts. Some children are still learning, like this is, the, this is the reaction. This is the cause and this is the reaction. All right, um, and the final mantra is it's not my job to control my child. I think a lot of us think that's our job, right? And when we try to control another human being, it typically does not work out well for us. We bring in a lot of power struggles. So in that moment, remember that you are there to limit, lead, guide, but controlling them is not your job. All right. Um, Krista shared, I am also having some aggression issues with my two and a half year old son. He's incredibly strong-willed and determined and hitting my husband and I um, to retaliate when he's upset. Um, I'm also having the hardest time with listening. When he wants to do something, he, he will do it. But likewise, if he doesn't want to, he will not do it. And so what I wanna to say to that is, yes, this is two, right? And nothing's broken, but you are dealing with a strong will. So remember that, um, when you can expect challenging behaviors like this, sometimes you'll be more in the mindset to respond instead of react. So um, I worked with a really powerful uh, five-year-old daughter and her mother, and she was, they were getting into a lot of power struggles. And one thing I invited the mom to realize and to look at was the power tanks on her child's back. And to recognize that if you have a powerful child at home, do, 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 are you showing or are you holding up the mirror to that powerful child that says you are powerful? Sometimes we aren't, we're scared of their power. We don't want them to, we don't want to fuel that. But what I want you to know is if it's their nature, then, then they want to know they're powerful. And when you can reflect that back to them, the power they are, the behaviors actually improve. So it comes back to our regulatory speech, much of this, and next week's class is all about power. And I printed out the sheet that you guys will have, but there are literally words that if you can just uproot them and avoid them and use other words, it's called regulatory speech, your child will hear you. It's like they can't hear you when they're in the middle of a power struggle with you. Um, so if you're dealing with a lot of power struggling, understand that next week's uh, course is all about that. Um, and that it might seem counterintuitive, but to empower your child to know themselves as powerful. So with this five-year-old, um, when we got off the call, the mom really internalized that invitation. And she took that little one to the swimming pool. And that little girl wanted to climb up and jump off, not the high dive, but the first platform at the pool. And these are Olympic level platforms. And because she had gotten off that call and the awareness was up, the mom said to herself, yes. And that little girl jumped off that first platform. It's like a whole story high. And she jumped down into the water. And that was a real learning moment for that mom. She realized that, wow, 
this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This is some of her superpowers as a human being. If I can lean in to the power that she is and the potential she has to be a leader, we will be fighting a lot less. And they also started uh, rock climbing lessons, I think, or, or just, you know, heading down to the rock climbing wall more together. Um, so I just throw that in there if that's of help. If you find that you're in constant battle with a child that you perceive to be a strong-willed child, are you embracing their power and finding positive, healthy channels for them to direct those uh, gifts that they have? Okay. Um, Christus went on. This is the same mom. She, so, she said, I hate to resort to physically trying to restrain him to go to the car seat if we are needing to go somewhere and he doesn't want to, or physically taking him out of a particular space. The toddler tower off the bed because he's jumping and not listening um, and breaking important safety rules. So what I want to point out here is I get a sense that you feel guilty or bad or you hate to set those limits. And I want to really drive home the point that boundaries are love, right? Your boundaries and your limits are a gift to your child. So cancel any guilt or feelings you're having as you set those limits that you are being mean or bad or wrong. If you can do it from your center, right? That is love. That is the limit your child is needing. Now, when you're doing that, it's not going to appear that you're doing this great thing. Why? Because your child on the other end is reacting to you and that limit. Do not take that to be a sign that you are off the mark, okay? So go to your center to, to make that decision, all right? To find your next steps and the tools you are gonna be working with. Do not be reactive to your child because what happens is then your child is leaving and, and you are the adult brain in the room and you are helping him or her learn to regulate okay now that is not to say they all the time are teaching us they are but they don't want that level of power where they feel like they're directing the whole household okay so do not be scared of their big emotions you can you can do what you're doing and name them name it to tame it feel it to heal it but give yourself permission to set those boundaries the story i shared there is about an oak tree if you are an oak tree, you are big and solid and rooted. And when something comes at you, you do not pull up your roots and run. You stay there, grounded, solid, centered, rooted, and you absorb that, what came at you. You're not rigid though. You have these branches and when the wind blows, there's a fluidity to you. You are responsive and grounded. And I want to help, I wanted to share that with you as an image that you can conjure up. You are that oak tree. So in the face of your child's misbehaviors or life, the chaos of life, channel that inner oak tree. And I think where that, those deep roots come from are the confidence to, to be with what is and the confidence to trust yourself to handle whatever life is going to be bringing your way. And that really comes back to our tools. Life without tools is hell. All right. So just recognize that you're just the beginning of this journey, pulling in all these tools and give yourself time to tap in deep and have that confidence to stay rooted in the face of something coming at you. It takes time. It's a new muscle. Okay. You're doing great. All right, so that was Krista shared. Finally, she had uh, one other element. She said, um, I have been struggling with him not sharing anything or wanting to take toys away from the other children uh, as he says they are mine. So the thing I would do here with a little one that's two or three is I would actually lean into silliness and I would play mine. I would, mine, mine, you know, be really animated and silly about it. And in the end, you might, okay, and then, you know, hand it to him. But if he thinks that you've been reacting to the idea of him owning things or having things or claiming things, and he's seen you be really reactive to that and upset about it, he thinks, oh, here's a way I can be powerful. It's a negative way. 
but it works every time. Look at how that makes mom get crazy, you know, when I do that. Look at all the attention and all the energy that happens. Um, plus, he likes the thing. He wants the thing, right? And he has a voice, and he is powerful. He's strong, so of course he's going to claim it and say it and declare it and take it. So once you cancel, that's bad, that's wrong, and you can be with it and understand it, you can help it regulate. You can help it integrate. So play the game mine. Um, and then if you really are with a child and he's taken it from them, you are going to be that calm and that boundary. And he may or may not like it, but you are going to teach in that moment. It's a teaching moment. I would start by saying what is. Michael had the truck. You wanted the truck. You took the truck from Michael. Michael said, you took his toy. So we're just, we're not having a big story about you're mean. You can't do that. That is so mean. Why would you do that? And shaming, we're teaching. So the toy will go back to Michael, right? He, if he's feeling safe enough, that child may be the one to hand it back, may, may or may not. But the idea is if we put them on the defense, we are surely not going to have the internalization of this moment and this lesson. So by noticing that this is a, a repeat issue, you as the parent have the power to break it down with that child and reteach it. One last tip I would give is teach it when it's not up. If you know the idea of mine and taking things as an issue, work with this when it's not up and in your face already. One way to do that are reading books. Another is through imaginary play and just by talking it through when we're calm. That will help worlds. Um, the last thing she shared was that her husband works a lot and she notices the jealousy in her son um, when the husband's home. My son tends to act out or act differently when he doesn't have mommy all to himself any guidance um, would be amazing. So I want to say there that, yes, again, look to the neuroscience of the brain of the little person. Children and really all human beings like predictability and the same routine and ritual. So instead of making it bad or wrong or an issue about dad or work or whatnot, just see it for what it is neurologically. This is different and different may not be comforting. So if you can then help the child better understand the rhythm of your weeks and maybe give them some predictability about when dad will be there and when dad won't, you might see a little less resistance or anxiety or what you're perceiving as jealousy. And if he is feeling jealous of your attentions when there's another person there, what you can do is whip out that play sheet. I gave you some ideas about integration of a child who's either wanting to be with one parent more than the other. And I like kinetic play for that. Running around the table, playing tag, playing chase, the three of you together. And then maybe having a war of like, I get it, I wanna hold him, oh, I wanna hold him, where both the parents are vying and he's feeling at the center of this. You don't do this every day, but by doing it even once, you're hitting a reset button. And maybe you need to do it more than once. But the idea here is bring your attention, your awareness, bring your playful spirit, and help your child feel secure in whatever about this pattern um, with dad being there is feeling insecure for him. And, and we don't have to judge those moments. We can just see them. Sometimes we, we go to guilt and we think, oh, I should be this, I should, da, da, da. and if the word should is preempting the next line, then you know it's from a lower path place. It's guilt that's running us in that moment. So I cancel the should, and then I look for the, the guidance that lifts me up, and then I go that way. All right, so thank you for those shares. Uh, let's see if we have any more. That's all of them. All right. So uh, thank you guys so much. I think it's so powerful that we have nearly 200 people from all over the world going through these classes together. 
Um, please know that I'm here. As you can see, I've been getting emails from, from some of your class participants. Um, I love knowing where you are, where you're breaking through, where you're feeling stopped. And when you graduate, if you uh, message me on Facebook, I can get you added to our graduate group. So that's a place where people are 24 seven sharing these sorts of real specifics. This is what's going on. What can I do? And when that happens, understand we are looking for support and we're looking to resonate and, in, and to tune our tuning forks with the, the kind of higher path tuning fork that this class is. Um, because we're likely triggered or dysregulated. That's why it's important for us to have support and community to have further self-awareness and growth. Just like we're doing for our child, we deserve to be held that way as well. So you're not meant to do this in isolation. None of us are meant to parent alone, okay? We are meant to be supported in community, to be heard, to be allowed to feel, to cry, to scream, to be sad, to be happy, to be celebrated in community, okay? So that is what this is about. Um, thank you so much for supporting Get Generation Mindful, for making the Time in Toolkit even possible. And my apologies that the recording um, went a little haywire at the front end. So you kind of jumped right in. Um, hearing sort of the close of the live session. And then I recapped the questions for you here. Um, I hope it was of service to you. And again, I will see you online and feel free to email me uh, anytime. Thanks again. Bye-bye.